Hello, welcome to this quick review of dot cross diagrams. Uh, this has uh, been done because I feel that many people who did the summer work uh, need a little bit of uh, extra coaching and help in maybe how to tidy up and uh, make their dot cross diagrams a bit more precise for the A-level chemistry course. So it shouldn't come as any surprise that it's a good idea to use the definitions that you're asked to go and remember as a basis for carrying out tasks. So for example, if you're drawing a dark cross diagram of an ionic compound, it's always a good idea to think about what the actual definition of an ionic bond is. And likewise, for a covalent dark cross diagram, you need to think carefully about what a covalent um, bond actually is. So I've put down here two uh, definitions which I'll keep on the screen whilst we go through some examples of dark cross diagrams. So there are certain aspects of these definitions that are key to actually making sure that the examiners uh, or the person marking your work can see that you clearly understand what you're talking about. So you'll notice I've now gone back and slightly changed my definitions in the sense that I've underlined certain parts of them. Those parts are the bits that are essential and cannot be left out. So the electrostatic attraction is actually going on in both cases, but the electrostatic attraction in ionic bonding is between two oppositely charged ions. Why do we say it's strong? Well, that's because it is. It takes a lot of energy to break these bonds, so you need to put that in to show that you understand it. In covalent bonding, you've still got an electrostatic attraction, but obviously it's not ions this time. It's the nuclei of two bonded atoms and the bonding electrons that are shared between them. So as I go through the how to draw the diagrams, I'll make reference to these uh, definitions so you can see the connection between the definition and the diagram to deepen your understanding. So this diagram shows how the bond in an ionic bond arises in the first place. So the metal, in this case sodium, loses one or more electrons from its outer shell, whilst the non-metal gains one or more electrons in its outer shell. So it's interesting to notice that how uh, the electrons are gained by the non-metal atom, the oxygen in this case. They pair up with ones that are already present in the outer shell of the non-metal atom. So this should be paid attention to when you're drawing your negative ion. You need to have the dots and the crosses paired up with each other. So what happens is the incoming electrons pair up with electrons in the outer shell. And these electrons are in spaces called orbitals. So basically all electrons occupy spaces in shells called orbitals. Now I'm not going to go into orbital theory here because that's not really the um, the rationale behind this clip, but I have done another clip on my channel that covers orbital theory if you want to look at it. So the first tip when you're drawing dot cross diagrams for ionic compounds is you position the negatively charged ion and the positively charged ions next to each other. So this is particularly when you have two or three positively charged ions and one negatively charged such as a two minus and two one pluses. And the reason for this is because you actually get attraction between them. Uh, if you look at the definition at the top, it says attraction between two, two oppositely charged ions. So by drawing them next to each other, you signify that there's attraction between them, as opposed to having the, uh, the two sodiums um, side by side somewhere else and the oxygen next to only one of them. So you could also do it like that. Obviously, you need to put your outer shells in but I'm showing the way you can orientate the two minus next to two pluses. So you can see that there's going to be attraction on either side of the two minus uh, to signify that the, the plus charged ions, cations, are in the same, are in the right places. Now you know, also need to remember to have an empty circle in the um, cation because that represents the empty outer shell or the outer shell that now has lost its electrons to the anion, in this case, the oxide ion. So here we've got two typical examples. On the left-hand side, aluminium fluoride. You can see how the fluoride ions have been arranged around the aluminium so that there's attraction shown between them. So that basically, the negatively charged ions, your anions, tend to butt up towards the positively charged ion, or the cation. Now you might notice that the aluminium fluoride 
has an AL3 plus ion and there's no circle within it, this is also okay. You don't have to necessarily put the circle in. What you mustn't do is put the next shell down, which will contain um, eight electrons. So it's worth uh, pointing out that the incoming electrons uh, that is, is being gained by the oxygen, they're paired up in the same way as we talked about when we did sodium oxide earlier on. So now moving on to covalent bonding, let's have a look at the definition again. So it's a strong electrostatic attraction between the nuclei of two bonded atoms and the bonding electrons that are shared between them. So you can also draw a covalent bond between two atoms by just drawing a solid line. So if you've got two solid lines between uh, two atoms, you've got a double covalent bond. So as you'd expect, multiple bonds are written the same way. But it's important that you alternate the dots and crosses when you do multiple bonds like this. So as always, unpaired electrons pair up, whether it's a single, double or triple bond. So, an unusual case, boron trifluoride. The boron only has six electrons, but it needs two more. So as you'd expect, BF3 is quite reactive. So here's another strange one. Twelve electrons in sulfur's outer shell. So what's happening is uh, that the covalent bonds confer stability to an atom. So the more covalent bonds an atom can undergo, the more stable it's going to be. So sulfur is quite happy to have six covalent bonds with uh, six different fluorine atoms. So the key to this working is sulfur makes additional space available. I might have remembered earlier on the clip I mentioned that a space around the nucleus that can contain up to two electrons is called an atomic orbital. So sulfur moves some of its orbitals around to its outer shell. So now we have extra spaces available. Um, this is called expansion of the octet. So an octet suggests obviously eight electrons. Twelve is bigger than eight, so the octet's expanding. So it's exam question time now. Uh, so when they say state what is meant, what they really mean is that uh, we want you to give the definition for a covalent bond. So some kind of version of what we talked about earlier, making sure you're mentioning electrostatic attraction between the nuclei of two bonded atoms and the shared pair of electrons between them. So I've ticked where you get the two marks. Then it says draw dot and cross diagrams to show the covalent bonding in fluorine, show the outer electron shells only. So it's worth actually remembering this uh, because quite often people will waste time doing all the inner shells as well. They're not interested in that, they only want the outer electron shells. So start by drawing the overlapping circles, allowing plenty of space to put your electron pair in. So don't forget the unpaired electrons, so the remaining um, six electrons per fluorine atom. So making sure that you're putting your electrons actually on the shell and you've got a nice clear overlap between the two circles so you can put the shared pair of electrons between them. So one mark for this because basically it's a skill that expects you to have from GCSE. So now what we can do is move the page down a bit. So then it says limestone contains the ionic compound calcium carbonate. And it gives you a bit of information, including the equation, and it tells you what compounds are formed, an ionic compound, CaO, and a covalent compound, CO2. So my definition is straight out of the textbook, the electrostatic attraction, important, between positive and negative ions. You could probably get away with saying oppositely charged, but what's the point in trying to change it for the amount of effort it takes to change it around? Just remember it from the textbook, positive and negative. That's that little bit more specific. So again, a mark for that. Now, be careful here, because they said, didn't they, in the question, one is an ionic compound and the other one is a covalent compound. So I'll put a little reminder down there for you, but you would be expected, obviously, to recognise that from the, the question. So let's do the ionic one first. So there's two ions because there's one calcium and one oxide. 
So I'm starting off by just putting the circles in. Now I have to populate them with electrons. So I've been quite careful to pair up the electrons properly in the O2 minus ion. You'll see there's a dot and a cross next to each other twice. So two of my marks are there because one is for doing the correct pairing, the other is for getting the correct charges and square brackets and all the rest of it. So now we can do carbon dioxide. So because you know you're dealing with double bonds here, you make your overlaps a bit larger to accommodate two pairs of electrons in each one. So you're drawing the electrons as alternating dots and crosses to start off with. So now you can add the non-bonding electrons and the oxygens. Uh, we call these lone pairs, but we'll come, we'll come on to that when you learn about um, intermolecular forces. Okay, so oxygen needs six electrons of its own. It's used up two in its double bond with carbon, so it needs four remaining electrons. So I can put them in there like that. And that gets my final mark. Okay, so that takes us to the end of this introduction to uh, dot cross diagrams or a quick review if you want to go back and have a look at it again. Um, thanks again for listening, and uh, until next time, see you soon.